evening, and uh, welcome to Medical Institute for Policy Research's Citizen Series Cafe Politique on Canada's role in international climate change. My name is Robert Earl, and I'm the Director of Operations for the Medical Institute for Policy Research. MIPR seeks to enhance public policy discourse in Manitoba by nourishing dialogue and debate on current and emerging issues facing Manitobans and their governments. Cafe Politique events are designed to situate and discuss important public policy issues facing our society in an informal manner. Tonight's topic is Canada's role in international climate change. And with the recent release of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's fifth assessment report, the impacts of and solutions to climate change in the international community is moving to the forefront of international policy debate. What role does Canada have in mitigating the effects of climate change? What opportunities do we, as a country, have to make as a positive impact on the international stage? And what are the risks of inaction to national and international interests? Discussing this issue and answering our questions this evening are Dr. Mark Hudson and Joellen Perry. Our moderator this evening is Mary Agnes Welch. Mary Agnes Welch is the public policy reporter at the Winnipeg Free Press. She joined the Winnipeg Free Press in 2002, first as a general assignment reporter and then covering City Hall and the Manitoba Legislature before moving to her current post. She was formerly the National President of the Canadian Association of Journalists and she's a graduate of, of Columbia University's Journalism School. Thank you for coming out tonight. At the end of tonight's discussion, I encourage you to complete the feedback forms and uh, put on your chair so that we can uh, um, know what policy topics you're interested in and what we'll be doing. So I'll pass the mic off to Mary Agnes. Uh, here's her own mic. So I'll turn it over to Mary Agnes to introduce our panelists and get this evening started. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Everybody's good? Okay. I might just remind our speakers to speak right into the mics because that's always uh, something we run into trouble with. So, welcome tonight. I'm so pleased to see so many of you here on such a beautiful night, uh, especially to talk about climate change, which I feel like we talk about endlessly and we talk and talk and talk and not a great deal gets done and it's a source of great frustration for me as a journalist um, and I've written a fair bit about it and I'm hoping to learn a ton tonight from the two speakers. This is really timely. Um, I'm sure if, you, if you're here, you've been following the release of the, uh, the latest IPCC report, uh, I guess two months ago now. Obama has just come out with his uh, coal-fired power plant um, regulations, proposed regulations finally. And, and I suspect this will come up tonight, Stephen Harper has said just in the last week that he is reluctant to do anything about climate change that will damage the economy or cost jobs. And that, I, and he says he's speaking, he's saying what uh, leaders around the world are too afraid to say. So I think that is quite an interesting uh, juxtaposition um, for the evening. So I'd like to introduce both our speakers. I think you all have copies of their sort of official bios, but I wanted to point out a couple of interesting things about them. So first we have uh, Dr. Mark Hudson. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Manitoba and the coordinator of the Global Political Economy Program. Uh, his recent work has been uh, really broad. I was thinking I'll at some of your most recent publications. He's uh, looked at everything from uh, the mechanisms that allow the public to say in oil sands development in Alberta. He's looked at uh, what makes us buy fair trade coffee or not. Um, and he's even looked at the timber industry's influence on forest uh, fire policies in the United States. Now he's working on something called the political economy of carbon markets. Abstraction commensuration and commoditization of the environment. I, I don't know what most of those words mean. So, <laughs> okay, okay, good, okay, good. Maybe that's a good thing, good. It's very serious. Um, so welcome, thanks very much for coming tonight, Mark. Uh, next, Joellen Perry. Um, any of you who are familiar with uh, sort of the ISD and climate change in, in Winnipeg, you probably have run across Joellen. She's the Deputy Director of Climate Change and Energy at the IISD, the International Institute for Sustainable Development here in Winnipeg which seems to be doing everything these days, from running the ELA to doing climate change stuff to sort of everything. They seem to have a hand in everything. Um, right now, she's working with Manitoba government um, on how to deal with adaptation uh, for climate change. Um, she's done a ton of work in the past uh, for the provincial government, um, but now she's sort of turned her focus to this adaptation question. Uh, she's also got international chops. She's worked with, uh, for CETA. Uh, she's done work in Ghana and Pakistan. Um, and done a research and project work on how developing countries are dealing with climate change, which of course is sort of even the, the larger topic that we might touch on tonight. 
So, um, I'm going to turn it over to Mark first, I think. Yes, Mark, you're going to go first. Speak for a brief period, then Joellen, and then we'll open it up to questions. Take it away, Mark. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, to the Manitoba Institute for Politics. Together. Uh, to Maria and Nicholas for uh, moderating and also to Joelle for coming out and then obviously to all of you for, for coming out. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces. For some of you, I see a lot of my students actually in the audience. Uh, I hope I don't bore you with stuff that I've already done in the past. Um, I'm going to start by telling you of what I don't know about and that is climate science. Um, and then I'm going to focus most of my very short time talking about the political economy of climate, uh, of climate change uh, in Canada. So I'm going to focus on the domestic side. Um, uh, Ms. Perry is a much better position, I think, to talk about Canada's role in the international negotiations, so uh, I'll let her and you'll be happy to let me let her uh, talk about the international dimension of things. Uh, and then I, I'm going to throw in a little bit of stuff about how Canadians feel about climate change because that's what sociologists are supposed to talk about, how people perceive uh, things. So first, the caveats, I am a sociologist. Uh, I'm not uh, a climatologist. As a result, I rely on other people's opinions about what's happening with global climate. My own choice on that is to rely on people who spend almost all of their lives studying climate science, day in, day out. Um, scientific opinion is overwhelmingly that global temperatures are rising. Um, it's overwhelmingly that this is human induced. Um, people will often refer to what they call the, the science, the scientific consensus on climate change. Now, to be perfectly accurate, a consensus is that everybody in the room agrees on something. Does everybody? in the world believe that it's getting warmer and that humans are to blame? No. Do all climate scientists who actually study this day in, day out, believe that the temperature is getting higher and that humans are to blame? No, but 97% of them do, right, based on their, their publications in peer review journal. Now this is, this is about as close as science ever gets to anything that we could call a consensus. And so I think that it's reasonably accurate to talk about a scientific consensus on climate change. Now, uh, not all Canadians share my views on that. Uh, so let's first talk a little bit about the perception issue. Uh, so this is from a the graph that I put up there. It's from a 2013 poll from Enveronix and the David Suzuki Foundation. And what it shows is that about 60% of Canadians actually believe that climate change is happening, that it's human-induced, right? So those two things ask together. We've actually come down from 2007 when it was about 66% of, of Canadians. Uh, that means that 13% believe that science is not yet conclusive on this issue, uh, that, um, and that's, that's up from 10% in 2007. And a solid 23%, it's gone up and down, but we're back down to uh, 23% now, uh, believe that it's happening, but they're not entirely convinced that people are, uh, are behind it. Right? So um, the significance of these numbers, the reason I put this up, is, is not because it actually tells us anything about the reality of climate change, but what it does show is that there is the sort of significance of the movement to create the illusion of debate uh, within scientific circles on climate change. Right? There uh, has been a very successful attempt to sort of sow the seeds of doubt about this scientific consensus. Um, so we see that there's been some effect of that in Canada. It's not nearly as bad as in the United States. In the United States, about 39% of the population are, uh, are what they call uh, sort of concerned believers. Right? So these are folks who think climate change is happening, they think it's a problem, they think humans are behind it. Uh, about a quarter of the population in the United States uh, are what they call cool skeptics. That is, they, they don't think climate change is really happening, and if it is, it's certainly not a problem. Right? Uh, so in the United States, this movement has been much more successful than it has in Canada, but in Canada it has some effect. There's some regional variation on this, so we can look uh, uh, provincially. Uh, some of the numbers, uh, Quebec is obviously uh, the high point here. Uh, I was actually a little surprised by this. I thought British Columbia would have the highest uh, percentage of people who accept climate science. Um, but we see that as we move west, especially into the resource-dependent kinds of uh, uh, provinces other than British Columbia, the numbers plummet. So we move down to a bottom of uh, 47%, I think it is in Alberta. Manitoba, uh, about 52%. So right here at home, uh, we're just over the halfway point of people who accept that climate change is happening and uh, that it is uh, human-induced. Uh, in terms of action, uh, the numbers sort of are broadly reflected. So a more recent poll that came out uh, from the University of Montreal and, and a think tank called Canada 2020 uh, suggests that about 60% of Canadians, 59% to be exact, uh, believe that climate change should be a top priority for the federal government. Uh, 75 or 76% uh, of respondents said that they think that we should sign on to an international treaty that limits emissions and that we should do so even if 
developing countries that are becoming large emitters unto themselves don't sign on. So the, the number remains consistent. Um, again, we see some regional variation on the question of action. Should we take action? It slides as we move into the western provinces. But across the country, as a nation, we do believe that the government ought to be taking action. So I want to look at the question of are we, are we actually taking some steps on this? Just before I get to that, I want to contextualize Canada's role within this global problem of climate change. Uh, the, the picture on the left uh, shows country by country rankings of um, their total emissions, and the one on the right shows per capita emissions. Right? So you can see that, that Canada is not exactly as giant when it comes to, to the global uh, contribution of uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, the US, the European Union, and China together make up about 55% of global emissions. Uh, on a per capita level, you see actually the big ones are some surprising countries, very, very tiny countries, countries like Gibraltar, uh, the US Virgin Islands, Netherlands, Antilles. Uh, mostly that's because they all import almost everything that they consume in these countries. We're not a giant, but we're also not insignificant in this. Right? So looking at total emissions, we are, I think, the eighth largest emitter in the world as of 2012. So while we put out about a tenth of the US's total, about 2% of the global total, uh, you know, we still have a lot of fat to trim. On a per capita basis of the major emitters, we're the fourth largest behind the United States, Australia, and uh, Saudi Arabia. So there's, you know, there's some space there for us to, uh, to improve. So what's our commitment on this? What have we internationally said we're going to be going? I'll leave this mostly to Joel and Perry to talk about. But just to, to preface it a little, in 2009, Canada and Copenhagen committed to a 17% reduction from 2005 levels of greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2020. Now, we withdrew from the Kyoto uh, Agreement in 2011, meaning that this commitment is only what they call politically binding and not uh, in any way legally binding on us. Now, first of all, it needs to be noted uh, before we go on that this commitment in and of, of itself is completely insufficient in order to take us anywhere close to where we need to be to avoid what they call dangerous levels of climate change. Uh, the, the agreed upon number that I, I'm going to throw out a lot tonight is, is two degrees Celsius of uh, average global warming, right? So once we go over two degrees, the scientists tell us things could get dangerous and unpredictable after that. We start to get into feedback loops that, uh, that uh, lead us into serious danger. So internationally, the agreed upon number under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change right now is two degrees is safe. Now that's it's a little bit controversial. Some people think we should knock that down by a half degree at least, but that's the number that I'm gonna uh, be using tonight. That's what we're considering safe. So we're a long way from that with our commitment. Our commitment is not going to get us there. But that aside, let's look at how we're doing just in terms of getting to what we've committed. Uh, so we look back to 1990. Uh, we can see that there's been some small progress in terms of the greenhouse gas intensity of the Canadian economy. So for every dollar of GDP that we produce in Canada, the amount of carbon that is produced as a result of that is actually sliding down. This is good news. So the blue graph. Uh, shows uh, met, uh, megatons story of, sorry, of carbon dioxide the ones that we're producing. The red line uh, shows uh, an index to 1990. You can see we're, we're sliding down. Now, person for person on a per capita level, we've also got a little bit of progress. From 1990, we're down about 4%. Right? This isn't huge progress. And certainly, we rose from 1990 up until 2000, but we brought it down to about 4% lower than the 1990 level. Now, what really matters in terms of our impact on climate change is absolute amount of carbon dioxide and other kinds of greenhouse gases that we're putting up in the, into the atmosphere. And on this front, we're not doing so well. So since 1990, we're actually about 18% higher than uh, where we were uh, back then. So rather than having brought our, our emissions down, absolutely our emissions are uh, going up and can continue to do so. So uh, in terms of our Copenhagen pledge, this is uh, a picture straight out of an Environment uh, Canada publication that shows our emissions to 2020. Um, we are going to make about uh, a third of our, uh, our commitment uh, that we made in Copenhagen. Um, the pledge was to get greenhouse gas emissions down to 612 megatons. Environment Canada is now predicting we're going to get it to about 734. So, historically things don't, don't look super promising. We're not making a whole lot of progress on this. What about the future? Uh, as uh, uh, Marianne has mentioned, uh, the US President sort of made some stirs recently within climate circles by uh, taking action. Uh, there on electricity generators, uh, slapping down particularly on, on coal-fired generation. Um, this causes some excitement, but again, as she mentioned, 
while Prime Minister Harper had initially had mentioned that it was incumbent if the United States takes action, it was incumbent on Canada to do the same, he has now stepped back from that and said, well, you know, the U.S. action really provides no further impetus than what we already had for Canada to take action. So we cannot expect a lot in terms of immediate or near-term uh, federal initiatives uh, anytime soon. I hope I'm wrong about that. Anything can happen, but I don't see it happening. So we need to ask what it is that's keeping Canada from moving forward. Why are our emissions so high? Why are we 18% above 1990? Well, oil and gas emissions are now uh, the largest contributor in Canada. They account for just over a quarter of all of our emissions. Now, by oil and gas emissions, I mean emissions that result from the production, the refining, upgrading, and the distribution of oil and gas. So transportation used to be the big sector in Canada, it's just been edged out, oil and gas is now uh, the largest sector, and it's also the big area of projected growth. Right? So if you look at the, at the chart I put up there, uh, the, the one area where there's projected to be major growth between 2005 and 2020 is in the oil and gas sector. Now within that sector, it's worth pulling out the oil sands within Alberta because this is really where a huge amount of the action in Canadian emissions is taking place. So if you look down, this is the oil and gas sector taken as a whole from 2005 to 2020. And you can see that, that uh, natural gas and conventional oil actually are projected to decline up until 2020. The single sector that's predicted to drive almost all of our emissions growth within that, and in fact counteract some of the reductions that we see in other parts of that sector, is the oil sands. So we need to be focused a little bit on, on that particular sector within, uh, within oil and gas. Um, so our stated climate change target seems to be fundamentally at odds with both our economic and our energy policy federally. There's a lot of friction there and it seems like the, e the economic policy and the energy policy is, uh, is taking priority. So just to give an illustration of how far out of kilter our energy plans are with the limits of a carbon constrained world, I want to look a little bit at what, what the IPC is now calling the carbon budget. So in their last assessment report, the International Panel on Climate Change came out and they told us a number of how many billions of tons of carbon dioxide we could put out into the atmosphere from the dawn of the Industrial Revolution to the day that we stop burning carbon before we start to get into trouble, before we hit that two degree warming mark. And there's a lot of flexibility if you look at the numbers. There's a lot of ranges in terms of well, how, how dangerous do we want to be? Do we want a 66% chance of staying within 2 degrees? Do we want a 50% chance of staying within 2 degrees? But it all kind of fluctuates around, for simplicity's sake, the number 1,000 billion tons, 1,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So this is what they tell us globally we can pump out into the atmosphere. We've used about a half of that by now, and that's sort of a generous estimate at this point, maybe actually more. But use about a half of it. So we've got about 500 gigatons left before we hit the sort of danger mark. Um, if we were to divvy up what's left of the global carbon budget on a per capita basis, give every single citizen on the planet the same amount, Canada would get about one half of one percent of the final budget. That means we'd get two and a half gigatons of carbon to put up into the atmosphere. Okay. So the nice thing about the carbon budget, even though it's sort of a, a, sort of a scary thing, sort of sets off alarm bells, is that it provides a very clear focus on what actually needs to be done in order to stay below 2 degrees. So as the International Energy uh, Agency suggests, the budget implies that we need to leave about two-thirds of our current fossil fuel reserves, that's coal, oil, and gas, in the ground through 2050, unless there's widespread adoption of a very uncertain technology called carbon capture and storage, which we can talk about in the future. Canada, as you can see up here, has about 91 gigatons right now of carbon in our proven reserves in the ground. We've got about 174 gigatons of probable reserves. So the Canadian government, the Alberta government, and all of the international and domestic oil uh, companies that are currently investing heavily in the oil sands are behaving as though we can dig up, distribute, and burn every iota of fossil fuel that's under the ground. That's about 265 gigatons in total, if we use probable reserves as well. Our fair share is two and a half gigatons. Right? So, we're way over our budget. What explains this? What explains the, the disconnect? What explains the federal government's complete inaction so far on climate change? This is speculative, but I'm going to offer a couple of things maybe for discussion, a couple of possibilities. 
One thing is I think that while most Canadians believe that climate change is happening and is caused by humans, only one in four people who self-identify as Conservative Party supporters actually thinks that climate change is happening and that is human-induced. So the federal government does not feel particularly vulnerable on this issue. Uh, they read the situation such that Canadians and, and Conservative Party supporters in particular are unlikely to punish a foot-dragging approach on climate change policy. And there's some historical record to support them. For example, when we pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol in 2011, there was very little political price to be paid for that. The second explanation uh, that I think we need to look at is the federal government's very wholesale commitment to oil and gas as the main driver uh, of the Canadian economy. Um, now, given that there are any number of alternative growth strategies that do involve alternative renewable forms of energy, energy efficiencies, that do lead toward long-term long -term reasonable, sustainable growth paths, we need to ask the question, well, why oil and gas? Why have we paid so much of our fiscal and economic future on this one sector? And I think this raises the question of the political influence of the oil and gas lobby in Ottawa. So, just to give a couple of indicators of this, between 2008 and 2012, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers and the Canadian Energy Pipeline Association together spent about twice as much time as any other industrial lobby group sitting in the offices of federal office holders. Twice as many, right? They are dwarfing everybody else's lobbying capacity in Ottawa. Last November, for example, the Globe and Mail reported uh, on the successful efforts of the, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers to uh, convince both the Alberta government and the Canadian federal government to pull back on pushing forward with emission, emissions reducing uh, regulations. So, in conclusion, I think that right now our situation is one in which science and, and economic power are butting heads with one another within Canada. We know, with about as strong a certainty as science can produce, that we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. We know that we need to do that quickly. We're already facing the consequences of not taking action sooner, and those consequences are very likely to become much more dire the longer that we wait. We know all this. As an old Confucian philosopher once said, though, to know and not act is to not know. Or, as the great 1980s punk band from Canada, DOA, put it in more or less the same terms, ah, minus action uh, equals zero. And I think that echoes, I think, what you had said earlier. So, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, John.